Um, hi guys, what's up? Uh, so my name is Philip. Uh, nice to meet you, all of you. And today I, I would like to talk to you about large-scale data quality verification with our somewhat newly released uh, data uh, quality library called DQ. All right. So the the first question that you that you probably that that you might be asking yourself is okay, how is data quality relevant to me, and and how might it be relevant to my team? And I'm going to try to motivate that uh, with a few examples. And, um, and then after that, we're going to have a look at uh, a few prominent use cases of our library. Um, how to, uh, so the obvious case is just to, so you have a single batch of data and you want to verify data quality. But then also we look at the generalization of this, where you have like ever-growing databases for partition data sets. And um, so yeah, our library is open source. It's hosted on GitHub. There will be a link at the end of the presentation. And um, yeah, what I, what, so just to get this out uh, in the beginning, I think asserting data quality before you actually work with the data and consume it in downstream consumers, I think that can, we have seen that in the past, that it can save you from some, some debugging and error fixing work. All right, so why should we care about data quality? So the first reason that I want to, that I want to bring here is because Data, so most of human and algorithmic decision, uh, decision processes or decision-making processes are backed by data. So that means if the data is just wrong or, or missing, we have the wrong conclusions. So I think that's maybe the most important one because it's so general. But also, um, what was found is that data quality can have an impact on uh, ML models. And what they found is on a Sigma 2016 tutorial is that data quality can be considered sort of as the most important hyperparameter of an algorithm that you have. Um, what they did is they took an IMDb movie review, um, movie review sentiment uh, data set. So they tried to predict the sentiment of a data set. And they just took standard out-of-the-box scikit-learn um, pipeline with uh, stop words removal and all of that and HPO on top, so hyperparameter optimization. But what they found is, so this um, purple bar here is that they actually um, received much better predictive performance after they cleaned up their data. So data quality can have an impact on ML models. Okay, and if you, if you look at, so <laughs> this little box here, that's the ML code. That's usually scikit-learn and, and all of that. Uh, but usually in a production scenario, um, ML models coexist with other very, very data-centric components. And that might be just data collection, data verification, and then, of course, feature extraction. And as all of these components uh, are, um, so they, they deal with data, um, you, you might consider also looking at data quality for these components to, uh, to have the most efficient. OK, so the last point that I want to make is on operational stability. So, Everyone, I'm sure, knows of the infamous null pointer exception, and, they, and these except, type of exceptions can bring any production system to an abrupt halt, really. And this usually happens if there is data missing. Um, and this is a very obvious case, right? So uh, just systems crash. But there is also a much more subtle one. Um, so I tried to depict a machine learning model with this cloud. I didn't find a better picture. But imagine this is a machine learning model, and it is configured to be consuming some upstream data source. And of course, this model is uh, making basic assumptions of, about the data, for example, of the scale of an attribute. And here, so it thinks that it's square meters, but maybe at an arbitrary point in time, the data producer might decide, OK, well, I want to change it from square meters to square feet. And if that happens, then it's very likely that the model will not crash, but it will rather um, produce predictions that are slightly off. And finding these kind of, uh, these kind of errors is very hard because they don't um, yeah, they, they, they don't make um, services and systems fail, really. Okay, so looking at um, quality assurance, so split by if we either look at software systems or at data, I think in, in software systems, at least we know how to do this very well. Uh, so there's a long and well-established practice of how to assure the quality in software systems. So depending on the complexity of the component, you might just um, write unit tests, and if it becomes bigger, uh, integration and acceptance tests and all, of, and all of that. Oftentimes what we have observed with data is that um, data, so verifying the quality of your data often has resulted in very repetitive and ad hoc um, efforts. And having this, this sort of approach does not really scale in a way. 
And that's why we are working and have recent, quite recently released DQ. This is uh, the, the, the framework that I'm going to be talking today uh, about. And this allows you... So if you take one thing out of this talk, please remember you can unit test your data with that. So that's the basic catchphrase of this library. Okay. All right, so the, that's a schematic overview of DQ, so here in, in yellow. And there are basically two inputs to DQ. So the first one is data, of course, right? And the other one is you as the user interacting with this uh, framework or library. And what, what the user usually does is um, the user defines these data quality constraints. This is here on the top. All right, so how does this working? Let's, let's look at the center of this um, schematic. At the center of the queue are metrics computations, and they are backed by Spark. And I will talk about it in a minute, why that's the case. Um, and when, when these metrics have been computed, then they meet these, cons these constraints that have been user-defined. User and then depending on the outcome of the, of, the, of the evaluation of these constraint verification, the tests might either fail or succeed, right? And then that will give you an indication of whether the data quality is at the desired bar that you want to, want to be at. Mm, okay. All right, so a typical unit test in DQ obviously has to scale to big data sets. So that's the reason why we have used Apache Spark. And most of our metrics are formulated as SQL aggregation queries over the data. Um, nothing in our design in DQ ties us particularly to Spark, because you could be just plugging in any SQL-compliant backend that supports user-defined aggregation functions. So, okay, given that it scales to big data sets, then what it usually does is it computes one or several data quality metrics. For example, you might be interested in knowing, okay, what is the how many nulls do I have in this set of columns or this particular column in this data batch? And um, so this would be the completeness metric here. There are also, there's a bunch of others. And then given, uh, given that we have computed these metrics with Spark in the backend, then we, then we will apply your user-defined validation code. So you might be asserting then, okay, I know the, the completeness, so there are 2% missing values. Is that acceptable to me as an engineer? Or is that already too much? And depending on that, you, you can reformulate your verification logic. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at some code because maybe this is most actionable. Um, all right, so in the queue, we have, um, we expose several, uh, several APIs. The first one here is um, verification suit, and the other one is a check API. And uh, I've bold faced all of the checks here that are, that are being declared here. And what this is doing essentially is we, we have some data, Spark data frame in that case um, that, we want to, that we want to verify the data on. And then we're checking for the completeness of the customer ID and the title column. That means we allow for, for zero null values in, in these two columns on that particular batch of data. And then we also assert on the uniqueness of the customer ID. That means that there should be no duplicates in this uh, column over all of the rows. And then here it becomes a little bit more interesting. So we also have, um, you can be passing in, so yeah, I don't, yeah. over here, this is basically the user-defined validation code. So what we do is in the backend, we compute the count distinct of titles. So the number of distinct titles in the, in the data batch that is, that is present, that might be known, or there might be a value that you would wish for. And you could assert with any kind of logic that you want with this. And the interesting thing here is that num titles might be stemming from another part of your system. You might even be calling uh, while, while the code is executing another service to be getting a hold of the most relevant value that you want to assert against. Okay, and then, yeah, some, some more. Uh, you, can, yeah, you can also assert against histogram values, so you can just compute the histogram of a particular, um, of a particular column, in this case, device type. And you want to assert, in this case at least, that there should be no more than 84% of phones present in this column. And priority should always be either high or low. Um, just one more sentence about this here. So the uh, anomaly check, these checks, anomaly checks are a bit special as they are, as they are um, making use of a metrics repository. I'm going to dive into that, how to use that and how it's, how it's applied um, uh, in a minute. But essentially, what this check is asserting is that the size, so sorry, so the size of this data set is essentially similar to previously observed ones, if you compute that every day, for example. Okay. Now, 
Let's have a look at, um, at a concrete example of how you would do that. So that would be the, the code that I just showed you is the, si the singular data batch, and you want to verify data quality against it. But now you have ever-growing databases. For example, you ingest impression logs, and now how do I do that? If the data is partitioned in a sensible way, and here I'm assuming daily partitions. And what we want to do, we have basically two objectives. We want to assert the data quality um, on every day individually, and we want to assert the data quality verify the data quality um, of the data overall. All right, so here let's have a look at the naive implementation first. So today, right, it's Tuesday. And what we have done here, we have applied DQ uh, on Sunday, we have applied it on Monday, and the output of these computations were always the metrics and the outcome of our unit test, that they succeed or that they fail. Um, and then in the naive computation, for example, on Tuesday, you might be interested in, OK, wait, hang on a second. What is the data quality of Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday if, you, if I just union all of that data? So in the naive approach, what you would need to do is you would, you would need to rescan the data, which can be arbitrarily costly, right? Because the raw data can be, can be huge. Um, and ideally, we want to save ourselves some computations on the data if we can. That is what the incremental approach is basically addressing. So we, what, we're doing exactly the same. So today is still Tuesday. Um, we, have to, we have applied DQ on Sunday and on Monday. However, we have not only computed the metrics, but we have also computed intermediate states. These are these states that are um, on the bottom here. And these states are, you can imagine them sort of as summary statistics of the data um, regarding the metrics that you want, com want to compute. And these, these states are much, much smaller, usually, than the raw data. And you can combine them also efficiently. And then what you can do is, um, maybe I will just show some code. Um, so I've tried to boldface here a bit. So the new partition, that's, that's, that would be the partition of today, so Tuesday. And, from, and here, in this particular example, we are interested in the completeness of the origin column. And um, we, compute from the, we compute the state from the, from the data. This is the summary statistic for the completeness metric. Then in the next line, what we do is we load the previously computed states that we might have computed two days ago and one day ago. And then we, we take the union. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, you can sum over the states, or you can union them. And then we arrive at the overall uh, table state that in, includes the state from Sunday up, up until Tuesday, including. And then, given, given the state, you can compute metrics from the states directly. And that is probably more uh, cheaper than uh, having to scan all of the data again and having to load all of that. So that's the basic motivation for this. Um, all right. So the, the second use case that I, that, I want to show, that I want to show you here is um, a continuous, sort of continuous, hands, more hands of the wheel solution to data quality verification. So imagine the same assumption. So you compute uh, data quality metrics every day. And let's imagine this value column here. I didn't add any units, but let's say that's the number of rows of some, of some data frame that you're inspecting every day. And then the stashed line is your, your user-defined, so, so your defined threshold that should not never be exceeded. So for example, data frames should never be larger than 2 million rows. Right, but coming up with these absolute numbers can be sometimes very tricky. So that's what anomaly, these anomaly-based detection, uh, anomaly detection-based checks are doing. They are making the assumption that the data today should be very similar to the data in the metrics space, should be very similar to the data that we have seen earlier. OK, another code sample. Um, and here, maybe I can spend a minute talking about the metrics repository. So this is, is exactly the same. So we still have a look at the verification suit. We have a, um, and we declare these uh, checks over the data. And here, in this particular instance, we make use of a file system-backed metrics repository. And the metrics repository is uh, just your container where you can write metrics to and you can read it from. And what this anomaly check here, the online normal in this case, is doing, it's reading the relevant metrics from the metrics repository that, you, um, that it needs to be estimating sort of what is, a, what is a normal data set size, because here we're looking at the size metric on the right-hand side. And, and given, that the, this, um, given that this anomaly check has a basic idea of what um, a typical data set size might look like, 
it can then make the test either fail or um, succeed, depending on whether the data is similar in that space. And um, we implement a number of different, very rather simple and straightforward strategies. So the one might just be a simple thresholding strategy, like laid out here, or um, an online normal estimator. So that does just takes, takes the mean of all of the Right, so it computes the mean of the sizes and the standard deviation and make, sort of makes this normal assumption. Um, all right, so let me, let me uh, try to wrap up the talk. So I hope that I could have convinced you that human and algorithmic decision making is mostly data backed, at least it should be, if you want to be objective. Um, and for that reason, I think we should care a lot about data quality because that directly impacts our decision making. What we often have found is that data quality verification results in ad hoc efforts that are very tedious to the engineers implementing that. And um, yeah, it is not reproducible uh, and not standardized in a way. And for that reason, uh, we have released DQ that is um, basically enabling you to have a framework for all of this where you don't have to write custom scripts to check for the completeness, the sizes and all of that. And it gives you uh, Hope, we hope at least a concise API to come up to declare these checks over the data. And um, also as part of DQ, as, I, as I've um, shown earlier, we enable uh, the, the use cases of ever-growing databases that are partitioned in some sensible manner, and then also the more hands-off-the-wheel solution with anomaly detection-based checks. Um, if, you are, if you are interested in all of the nitty-gritty details of the experiments that we ran before um, releasing the library, we have a VLDB paper. Um, please feel free to check it out. Uh, please feel free to check it out. And yeah, definitely give the, give the repo a look if you want. And we also have uh, quite recently actually released the um, AWS Big Data blog post. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take questions now. Any questions? Oh. Uh, first of all, thanks for the talk, Philip. Um, as I understand, DQ currently just works on batches of data. Is there any plans to have it for streaming data? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, so at the moment, we don't support it, the direct streaming case. However, um, I mean, you, you can always batch streamed data, if that helps. But at the moment, unfortunately, my answer is that we don't support that kind of use case. Hi. We think it's really good work. We're actually using DQ. Um, but how does it compare with, I mean, TFX? We, they have the data validation, and in particular, they impute a schema based on a given training data, and they output as a JSON file, and then when new data comes in, they'll automatically validate it and print out the, you know, the differences and, and, and uh, rows that break that. Um, do you have any plans for that? And uh, what about Python? Maybe you take any YAML file as a, <laughs> you know, I mean, any, any thoughts on, on the, you know, the roadmap? Yeah, the roadmap is pretty much open. Um, we've had several requests to support um, also Python-based environments, for example, PySpark. There are some components that I didn't talk about uh, that are part of DQ. Um, that is the um, automatic constraint suggestion that maybe comes a bit closer to what TF access in terms of schema validation, because we try to automate the, the generation of the, um, of the constraint verification logic. So we look at some data and we do that for, for some amount of time. And then we probably have a good idea of what all of these um, constraints should look like. But, but, as, I, but as you ask, um, so the roadmap is pretty much open and we're happy to, to um, take requests. <laughs> Any more questions? We have one minute. I would like to ask two questions. First one is how many people are working on this project? That changes um, from time to time, yeah. but a couple, definitely. Okay, okay. And uh, the second question, I see two use cases. First one is like, uh, because DQ is a unit test library, so uh, I could write the Spark job and then uh, 
then uh, create some artificial data and test and uh, write tests in DQ and uh, check it. Or, or I can uh, I can um, have a like a data checker job which I would run uh, every day, for example. So what's the the use case? What's the primary use case for the? It's like uh, to run it regularly or to run it from time to time when I want to check that my my uh, job is version correctly. Yeah. So my answer is definitely going to be you, you. You. Yeah. You should aim at doing that continuously every day. Okay. Because if you do that that way, that uh, only then you have the best idea of how your data behaves, and. Um, yeah, so we, we have seen abrupt changes in data distributions, and if you don't do that every day, you might just be missing the point. And once the data has been basically propagated to all of your consumers, then it's already too late, right? So, because then they have maybe consumed already this faulty data that might have been caught. I'm saying might here, but might have been caught to, by data quality verifications. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Philip. Thanks.